Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the uh, Fraud Boxer podcast here. Uh, I have Kevin Goschuk from Arcos Labs here today, and I think we're going to get a little more technical than we're normally used to. Uh, him and I caught up when we were at the Merchant Risk Council last week. I do have some episodes still in the can that I haven't put out yet. This one's going to come out ahead of those. Uh, my voice was a little off, so now we're uh, we're getting the voice back, so I'm happy to dive right back into this, get some uh, some after MRC sessions go up with what people have learned there, what people talked about, keep this uh, conference high going. So Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jordan. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me on. It's, uh, you know, I saw you wearing the, uh, wearing the merch at MRC. I'm like, hey, we should, we should do something. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff we could talk about. Yeah. And I'm excited to have you on here because, because normally, you know, we talk so much about just fraud prevention stuff, but you guys go a little more technical into some of the, the more advanced things that happen to us, you know, bots, are, are a big thing that I see we talk about a lot, but a lot of the software and a lot of the, the people out there don't really address them. And you guys do. And I think some of the stuff that you guys are working on is actually really, really, really cool. You know, you and I obviously caught up and talked about some of those things before. So I'm really happy to bring those to my audience uh, for people that have more questions. Like they hear us talk about the bots, like I said, but they don't know what to really do. They leave those conversations and they're like, well, what do I do? Well, now they got somebody they can call. So yeah, we like, when do we meet? How do we even meet? So I believe we met uh, MRC, of course. MRC brings everyone together. So yes, it does. shout out to the MRC. If anyone's a merchant dealing <laughs> with fraud and risk, we highly recommend you head to the MRC conferences. They're great. Um, I believe it was 2019 in Seattle. So it was one of the, the regional ones that they, they put on. And uh, I was giving a presentation with um, – uh, one of our customers, Expedia, and we thought it'd be hilarious if we brought some of the Expedia gnomes to the event. And we gave out these gnomes as part of the presentation. Um, it was with Clayton Foster. He's obviously a long-term uh, MRC goer as well. And uh, I believe you're in the audience. I don't know. Do you remember that? I do. I remember I got a gnome. It was squishier than I uh, than I expected. I have it somewhere. Like it's. I just, I've moved 15 times since 2019. But man, like if we would have known what was coming at that, because that was like the fall of 2019 and we were just going about life was normal you know we were going out to nice dinners we were lo jo joking and laughing having a good time doing quizzes you were doing great presentation up there and then about three months later the world was about to end but hey you know we're back now <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah it's uh you could never have predicted what we just went through and the aftershock i guess of how this has changed the workforce and stuff like that like i don't think anyone was predicting that ever like that was just not in cards not so, at all and like I was going to the office every day. I used to ride the bus and the train here. Like I have a car. I just don't like traffic. And I would rather do other things while while in traffic. So I actually used to ride the bus and, and the train in LA. Anybody that's from LA knows it's not a pretty situation. But now I would never even dream of going back to the office. Like this is like my home office, work from home. That's my forever thing. <laughs> you, you and many others. Yeah, I do miss people though. Like sometimes actually I get invited to go to the office. I got invited to go this Thursday and I was like all about it. But then I realized I have to drive 30 minutes. Um, so I'm going to put it off another week. Good. That's a good sign of humanity that you miss other, you know, people in general. So that's, that's a good trait to have, you know. Yeah. Every once in a while I emerge from my home cave uh, about once a week. And then for about 15, 30 minutes, I, uh, I experience people and then I go back. But, you know, <laughs> I get to see you guys all over this lovely Zoom and record everybody. So we still that's have that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Fair so let's, let's talk a little bit about you, where you came from, and then we'll talk about Arcos, and then we'll get into the meat and bones of this bad boy. So, so let's let's hear all about you. Yeah, so um, so I'm a computer engineer, so a little bit more technical than than probably the typical um, folks in the in the kind of fraud space. Where I'm a bit of an outlier, I would say. Uh, I studied game design and computer science in Australia, so I'm obviously slight accent, but I'm originally from Brisbane, Queensland, in Australia. Um, and then on the back of getting a bachelor of that, I went into the health space and I spent a couple of years, uh, building technology to, uh, diagnose diabetes earlier of all things. Oh. So it turns out the nerves at the back of the eye are a really good view into your health and a patient without diabetes, uh, the nerves all converge in a whirl in one central place. And you can see that quite clearly with these pretty fancy cameras they have that let you look at like 500 times magnification. And a patient without diabetes, the, the, the nerves do not converge in a well. So it's actually very clear. You can just visually see it. The problem is they couldn't map it. They couldn't chart wow. that imagery. So I, I wrote software and we had a pattern and stuff that um, let them map the uh, the cornea, the kind of the back of the eye, 
And uh, after two years of kind of building that technique and kind of proving it out and letting them build a repeatable and some software that let them kind of easily extract it and tell them, yeah, one has, one doesn't. Um, there's about an eight year clinical trial period. So I wasn't involved in that. I didn't want to stick around for eight years just <laughs> over and over again, but they went through that and that software is now actually being used uh, in the UK to help diagnose diabetes. And you can actually now go to an optometrist and you can find out up to two years earlier than traditional uh, methods like blood pricks would actually inform you. So uh, small contribution to health, which was uh, really awesome. That's, that's really fun journey. Really cool. So quick question about that. Is it for type one or type two, or can it do both? Type two. Okay. That's super interesting. I'm going to have to go read more about that after we're done recording here. <laughs> it is, the study was called the Landmark Study. I believe it was longitude. Oh, I can't remember what the acronym was. It was like longitudinal assessment of neuropathic. I don't know. I don't remember. It's been a long time. It's been like 12 years. But um, yes, I did that. And then on the back of that, uh, I was granted a scholarship award by a large not-for-profit in Australia that focuses on people with intellectual disabilities called the Endeavor Foundation. And I was, um, they kind of saw the work I was doing as a student and said, hey, we want to see if you can build something interesting to kind of get these people up and more active. And uh, did that for a few months. That was so successful that the government and the university co-invested half a million dollars to help me commercialize that technology. And uh, we ended up ultimately licensing that at about two or three years in. So I built that for a couple of years. But both of those... Um, you know, I was very focused on computer vision techniques. So understanding what a machine could recognize and interpret and then use that to, you know, kind of build a, a social gamification experience for the people with intellectual disability and the context of the health project, be able to map and chart these images. Um, and both of those obviously led to having core domain expertise in, in the ultimate pioneering idea of what then became Arcos uh, shortly thereafter. Wow. Like, so you did all these, like, this is a completely different industry that like oh, yeah. you're in, in reality. Wow. That's, I had no idea that, that you had all that, that previous stuff. Um, that's very, that, I mean, it's that's about, really you know, impressive. It's out, of it's out of the box. You don't build a solution like Arcos by being someone in the space, I would say. So we, we, we certainly came at it from a very different perspective. I, I co-founded Arcos with one of my lecturers at, at the university I attended actually. So he was uh, the uh, early game designer. He was a game designer lecturer. So he was doing kind of user experience design of our product. And uh, I just caught up with him a couple of weeks back in Brisbane. He's, he's not actively working with Arcos right now, but he was there for many of the early years. But um, two of us kind of came up with this, this concept of, hey, let's utilize things that machines aren't good at doing and shouldn't be good at doing. There shouldn't be any commercial value in them doing it. And the objective is simply make it more expensive for adversaries to attack it than their return on investment they get back. Yeah. Doing it. So it's, it's a very different approach to anyone that's ever tried to build anti-bot software before. And we see some people talking about it. Obviously, they've seen us talking about it for all the years, but no one builds the software that way. Like it's still fundamentally built very different. Like the strategy is still very different to what we see the other players do. And it's really the only long-term strategy against fraudsters is if they don't make a money, they don't attack you. Uh, as I'm yeah. sure like, your audience would be very aware. If there's nothing of value, you're probably not being attacked. Yeah, I always tell people like, you know, you're probably never going to solve your actual fraud problem completely. But if you can make it just annoying enough that they don't make any money, they'll just go away and attack somebody else. And that's at the end of the day for for most of us, I think that's that's the goal. But I think you're totally right. Like most of these, the software that people use to, to stop bots is the the bot piece of that is more of an afterthought than right. it is a forethought you know and i think that's where you guys you guys changed it up a little bit is this this was your plan going in that's right i'm not mistaken yeah that's right and it's and it's kind of a pretty big contrast like if you're using a bot solution which is just designed to stop bots which is pretty much every other player in this space they're pretty happy if they're stopping 90 percent of the attacks being thrown at you they're like that's great or 99 percent. they're like amazing look how good of job we're doing we're constantly every day stopping 90 percent the only reason you're seeing 90% being blocked every day is because the percent that gets past them is enough to fund the attacks. Whereas with an Arcos, the big difference is they stop attacking once it's, you know, once the mitigation occurs, they actually give up and they might try and a new attack, but they, they just give up and they go away. Um, so there's a pretty big difference there in terms of um, like what the traffic actually does. And that's something you can kind of look for in your logs and your metrics and be like, Hey, we just continually get hammered by attacks, no matter what we put in place. It's just simply because there's enough of it getting in that they're still making money. Yeah, I think that um, 
you know, even you block 90%, like that 10% is still usually a lot. Like people don't realize like bots, it isn't one or two. It's thousands, millions, billions hitting you at a yep. time, you know? So 10% yep. of a billion getting through is still a lot, a lot of crap getting through there today. Yeah, and some of the yeah. stuff we're going to talk about today uh, will really kind of talk about like even some of it getting through is very costly. So you you got to have a pretty good strategy around this stuff because, yeah, you're right, it's, it's millions. You know, we have one customer where we prevented billions of fake accounts last year. Like these are just tremendous scales that they throw at people. Um, and they're making three, four cents each account they open. Like it's Jeez. really profitable for them, right? Yeah, I think like, and you guys have some pretty good marquee clients. Like, I, I mean, I think you, for, on your website, you list you list a few. So people, if you go to Arcos, uh, their website and actually look at that, you'll see some of them. I personally have experienced it on um, Blizzard before trying to get into an account uh, that I hadn't logged into in 10 years. I wanted to see if um, World of Warcraft was still a thing and it kind of was. Um, so, and I, I got in there and played around a little bit during COVID times, but I did I did encounter your guys's, your CAPTCHA, which is just one small piece of, of your overall business. But it was um, it was very comforting to see a familiar name pop up on my screen, you know. That Blizzard was... Blizzard is a very near and dear customer to me. So uh, the most the most stressful thing I've ever done in my life, not running a company during the madness that we live in right now, was running a guild in World of Warcraft in high yeah. school. That was far more stressful than uh, than running a company. So it were you there? Like, were you playing out. Guild Bank time? I remember when they added the Guild Bank and like. Everybody oh, was yeah. just assholes about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, so that's that's still happening. So the you know for folks that don't play video games, um, you know, guild leads have access to the entire guild bank funds, and you might have a few other people. And obviously, everyone's putting their money into the, the bank. And the intent of having a bank is it pays for the raids that you're doing every night, it pays for potions, it right. pays for materials to go to the raids, blah blah blah. But then you have some horrible people that are like, well. I'm just going to steal all the gold out of the bank and then transfer servers and rename my character and start the game with a new guild with all this gold that I can use to myself. So that that problem happens in real world as well as it does in video <laughs> games. Um, but uh, yep, there's all kinds of fun stuff that happens. Fraud and that's a, I guess that's a form of friendly fraud, I suppose. Yeah, it, it really is, you know, more. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're seeing some of that happen right now. And I believe we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um yeah, very much like you pay all these people pay these dues and then the one guy gets in and he does some social engineering <laughs> and off he goes with the whole bank, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ga gaming has so many amazing examples of, um, yeah, it's just, it's just an entire different economy, entirely different world. There's, there's so many, uh, interesting things that, um, attackers do, but, uh, yeah, I'm a huge gamer. Actually, our first customer was Electronic Arts. So we, we met Bing Gordon at a, a GDC and he, we pitched him our product and he said, it's a terrible pitch, but we need a solution like that. So I'll introduce you to the security <laughs> team. And we're like, oh, thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, we still work with Electronic Arts to this day. So it's, uh, and many other gaming merchants. Yeah, as I say, you guys kind of have the gaming gaming thing kind of cornered there, which which is a testament because, you know, I, I don't like, we, we, people always joke about gaming and and it's for kids, you know, it is what it is, but like, no, the adults that play and there's sophisticated things that happen in games. It's weird in games now where some of the bigger games, like there's full-blown economies, like your character in the game, yeah. especially like even in, in World of Warcraft, it has a job to do, an yep. actual job and a role. And you have to do it. You have to do it well. Otherwise you get quote fired from your job, you know, but there's, you, you don't just pick roles. You don't just get to click the button and pull the, pull the trigger all the time. Like you have, you have to heal people or you have to tank them, which is like pull all the bad stuff while other people attack. Like you have actual jobs. There's economies in these games trading. Like you, you this guy can craft this thing. This guy can mine the materials. So you have to trade and there's monetary that train, like it's nuts. And there's value, massive amounts of value in, stealing these established characters <laughs> like well it's yeah. is it's called real money trading is the big one so uh you know we we protect a large number of gaming merchants beyond blizzard you know we protect minecraft and and uh you know, grand theft auto and um you know roblox and many others um but you know one of the objectives is um taking the virtual currency from the accounts and then reselling that so people want to get ahead in these games they want to you know buy items weapons gear in the game and you need virtual gold to do that you can either go earn it yourself or you can uh, purchase it from third parties so there's like entire business economies where people are making millions of dollars a year by either using bots to create accounts and then automatically play the game and earn the gold 
uh, or compromise people's accounts, credential stuffing, et cetera, to then steal their virtual gold, transfer it to their other characters and then sell it. So there's there's like a whole um, fraud economy around this. I'm actually giving a talk at RSA in a couple of months about uh, lessons from the gaming world that can be applied to the metaverse and what's coming in the metaverse. Because the metaverse at the end of the day is just, 3D virtual world. It's going to have all the exact same problems gaming has already. So it's it's already a well-defined problem space and it's already been solved in many ways. Um, so it's kind of, a, it's just fascinating kind of watching that all be rehashed. But it's people that don't come from the gaming space building these metaverse companies. And they're like, wow, we didn't think of these problems. Like these have all been yep. solved before. This is the same thing we see happen. Every every new startup starts their thing and then they, they don't realize that fraud is a thing or bots are a thing right. and then it happens to them. You know, I can see people like with these these virtual deeds that they're doing in the metaverse where you like you buy a metaverse house and you get a real house in real life yep. with it, you know, like those things are going to be like people are going to be taking those and stealing the houses. Thank God we got the blockchain. But well, I mean, we're, we're at the end well, of the day, what can you do? So like JP Morgan opened a virtual branch in uh, Decentraland, at least it's called. And if you can go into a virtual branch in the metaverse and open an account or log in your account, check your account, what if someone sets up a portal and that looks like that virtual bank and you go into there and you accidentally hand over your credentials? Like, I don't know, there's a whole new world that, of engineering potential, right? That is very fascinating. So um, I am going to be at RSA 2, up at, the one in San Francisco, right? Because I, I know they do like some other smaller That's ones. the one. Too. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there too. I'm doing a, a panel on synthetic identities. So um, we'll just shout out everybody go to RSA, come watch both of our things. You know, um, Alexander Hall is going to be there too. Um, so all, all my guests, all my normal suspect guests, are good. we all have panels of some kind going on up there. Are you going to be in the yeah, big hall or are you going to be in the EFG? No, it's it's one of the big ones, like a 50 minute presentation. So it's, it's been a lot, we're working on it. It's been a lot of work. So I have no pressure. <laughs> it's it'll be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. but feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm sure you'll tag my Twitter or LinkedIn. 100%. I have a speaker discount code that I can give out to friendly. So if you ping me, we can give you kind of a discount rate to get in full, full, full conference pass. So you can kind of see my talk and you can see the rest of them as well. Excellent. Yeah. That is uh, one of the price of your conferences, but it is one of the more technical and useful conferences that, that comes in this type of space. You know, there's there's quite a few conferences now. We like obviously with budgets of the way they are coming out of the pandemic, we've had to be pretty strategic about the ones that we go to. And I do have to try and take speaking spots as much as I can to to lower yep. the cost so I can bring my staff because I like I, I love to go to conferences selfishly. I will fully admit like they are a ton of fun, um, but I do need to make sure that I'm training my staff and that they're learning, too. So I have to do what I can to make sure that I, I can sacrifice being up in front of a couple hundred people in order that to get one of my staff in, you know, for you spend the money there. Such a sacrifice <laughs> for you, I'm sure. Such a I, sacrifice. It's it, it's rough, you know. Like I, I, you know me. I don't like being the center of attention ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nope. So, um, I think that that's a good little segue. You know, I, I think we're going to talk about Arcos and and how they address all these things as we go through some of the the trends that you're seeing and the things that you're seeing right now, which I think are going to be super interesting. Going to be a lot different than than the normal trends that we talk about, check fraud and all that. This is going to be like actual hacking stuff that's happening so um i do want to get into that right now you know obviously like we were just talking about some of the, the banking uh virtual banking and guild banking and and some of the things that are happening with that i think it would be um kind of um a missed opportunity if we didn't talk about what's happening right now with a particular bank uh that a lot of us have had workings with in in the past like i have spent some time in the bay area a lot of the companies that i have worked with in the bay area have banked at this bank i'm sure that you guys might have some dealings with them so let's talk just briefly about silicon valley bank and some of the scams and, and phishing things that, that might be happening um as related to that and how it can be applied to the rest of us if, if you wouldn't mind yeah so let me i can first maybe key this off so silicon valley bank we are a customer of svb as is any tech company any, any of your tool providers, any of your vendors that are you know kind of high growth startups, they are all likely members of SVB. Um, the reason for that is a concept called venture debt. So venture debt is basically an extension to a capital raise. So if I raise $40 million, they'll give me an extra 20 million that can bridge me a little bit further until I need to raise more capital. And the intent of high growth startups historically, not anymore, historically has been um, you know, grow as quick as you can. Don't be profitable. Just grow, 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 land, land grab. 
that's shifted. That mentality's changed over the last 12 months, where it's now a profitability mindset. So that's we're going to see some changes there. Very different kind of businesses will survive a profitability world versus a high growth world. Um, but the way the venture debt works is you must maintain a minimum amount of your, your dollars with SVB, and you must do deposits with SVB, which is kind of a perfect storm when SVB fails. Everyone has all their money with them because that's what yeah. you had to do. Uh, just wanted to provide that context because I don't know if everyone knew that. It's like, why don't you have multiple bank accounts? Well, you couldn't. You weren't allowed to. Um, and they're the only one that did venture debt because they had relationships. Well, they're not the only one, but they're the best one. Because they have relationships with the VCs, they understand how high growth companies work, and therefore they can allocate risk based on that. A typical bank can't think that way. They don't. They look at your balance sheet, they look at your profits. They're like, "Yeah, now you're not profitable. We're not going to give you a loan." Yep. So it's a very different kind of bank. So it's a very important part of the ecosystem. Has been for forty years. Many of the big tech companies were built on the back of SVB. So yeah, it's incredibly sad to see kind of I guess what's happened. But um, the net net is uh, last week. You know they they failed. They know you know they've they've now opened this bridge bank and they're backed by the FDIC, which came out over the weekend, which is great news because a lot of companies I knew people that had fifty plus million dollars in there that they couldn't extract, which impacts any business. There's no business that can weather fifty million dollars just being you know taken off the balance sheet. That's even big 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 companies aren't okay with that sort of stuff. So it's uh, it's it's been pretty material, I would say. It's certainly sent shockwaves. And now the question is, what happens? Like, does SVB get acquired? Can they yeah. can operate as a bridge bank? They got a new CEO. I was talking to him yesterday. He's very committed to making it work. We're not all really clear on what that means. We don't know how long it's going to live for. So it's it's a little bit uncertain right now. So what everyone's doing is they're changing their bank details. So instead of our customers paying into our SVB account, we're asking them to pay into a a B of A or a Wells Fargo account. Yeah. Like, whatever their account and guess what that's an amazing time to uh, do some phishing attacks and social engineering attacks yeah i mean what, what better time to be like hey you know we understand you're a customer of uh please click here to to sign up for your account blah 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 we're part of the the government you know and you look at those headers and it's not even close you know like right people are panicked you know they're trying to pay their employees i think people don't understand like a lot of payroll goes through svb too everything um everything yeah, yeah. like there's there's regular people like i know everybody wants to say f the, the bankers at the end of the day um that's just like the uh the internet's you know rah 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 thing but like that's there's right. there's regular people that like that had nothing to do and no 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 say in the matter that were at the end of the day affected by this i think one thing that's going to be kind of weird coming out of this is like and i think you touched on it is like what is the future of like this debt going to look like? Like there's a lot of startups that everybody knows and uses every day that aren't profitable, you know, like it's going to, like it's going to have to be a very different scene. Cause like you said, for 40 years, you know, the idea is you start up a company, you go, 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 you get that growth. But in order to get that growth, you have to have user acquisition, which costs money in order to create a product that works and functions at scale, it takes money. So you need people to give you some money in order to do that. And like, even Amazon wasn't profitable until what, like 2015? Like, and we yeah. all were using them every day at that oh, point. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of companies, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's, so SVB is just kind of yet another, another thing on top of the broader ecosystem changes, which I'm sure everyone's seen the stock market and, you know, venture capital, raising venture capital in general has gotten a lot harder. Um, pros and cons. I think yeah. we'll get, at the end of the day, better companies on the other side of this. There's going to be probably fewer jobs in tech because less random things will get funded. Yeah. Um, but I think it'll end up being a net net better thing for the ecosystem. Cybersecurity as a whole is just full of really bad vendors with really bad technology. I remember going to Black Hat six years ago and every second booth said the same thing and then the following year half of those companies no longer existed the and and this actually is what ultimately led to the idea of we have a we have a, a, a guarantee on our product we have an anti-bot guarantee if you buy arcos we contractually guarantee we will stop attacks if we cannot stop attacks you can actually break the contract we're the only vendor that does that in our whole space i like slas <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing we did was we put a warranty on top of it. So not only can you break the contract, but we'll actually cover losses for you. So we have a million dollar uh, credential stuffing warranty. And that was fueled from the simple fact that it's so hard to stand out amongst all these companies that are getting funding that have terrible technology. 
Um, and that was what ge- was the genesis to me coming up with that idea. It's, it's, I'm thinking a lot of those companies won't get funding in the future. So maybe I wouldn't yeah. have needed to in, in, the, in the world to come. Yeah. Bad time for me to start kicking around an idea that I've been, uh, I've been like, I had in my head for a while now. So maybe I'll just, it's a good uh, idea. You'll be fine. Mind. If it's a good, yeah, idea, if, if it's a bad, I think idea, it's a good idea. <laughs> if it's a bad idea, it could be tough. we don't, we don't need the bad ideas. You can have a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not in it to get $100 million and run away. I'm in it to like secure my generational wealth. So we'll see. Go. We're going to start right. So I think that um that's a good a good transition into with the the, the an, an opportunistic time to start sending these phishing emails and start and start trying to to get ahead of of what these other people are doing as they move their money around these these large companies move their millions of dollars around. Yep. It's become this there's this group of people, a large group of people too, by the way, that their entire thing is to find a way to monetize exploits and sell them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything like that. That's, that's right. Yeah. So we, so as an example, like we're, we're reaching out to all of our customers and telling them, hey, don't send your money to SPB, send your money to our new bank account. And that's exactly what a fraudster wants. Yeah. Like that's a perfect send time. Send to my bank account. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that, and we've, we've, uh, uh, good customers that are good at InfoSec reach out to us on other channels like Slack and things like that. Hey, does this employee work for you? They're asking us to change your bank details. Like that's what you should do. If someone's, you know, if you're in the finance space, I don't know how many of viewers or listeners are in the finance space, but hey, if anyone's asking you to change bank details because of this, make sure to verify because it is a, it's a perfect time for fraud. This is absolutely happening as we speak. They jumped on this when there was the government handouts, they, they jump on this like the day of. They're in, incredibly impeccable on timing. So it's already happening. Yeah, I mean, these people, like you gotta remember, like most of the cyber criminals, like their day job is crime. <laughs> yep. So they're sitting there all day and they got 15 TVs running with every single news thing. And the second they hear something even rumbling, they're in there trying to figure out the under underworkings of it. Like there is... A tremendous amount and they're sharing it and they're selling what they're sharing and they're selling they're selling what they learn and i believe that that you guys and, and i think that most people do is they call it cyber crime as a service we all know software as a service but there's cyber crime as a service and i think that with you guys you guys spend a lot of time you have people that are actually in these channels yep. looking at these things like you're basically and you have brett johnson on there the the, the, the chief criminal you know that uh, former top 10 most wanted FBI. So you guys are aware of these things that are happening. And I, and I think that it's super useful. Like when you hire people that come from that world to, cause I have my sources that I do call uh, every once in a while and say, what are they trying to do here? And then they say, well, this is what I would do. And it's been super helpful to, to figure that out, you know? Yeah. So let me um, explain this a little bit more. So cybercrime as a service, this is, it's not a new like the term itself isn't new, but what I would say is new is the accessibility of it. So it, the accessibility has shifted quite a lot. So we historically, you know, we protect some of the largest companies in the world. Um, so we have a very large target on our back. That's just the nature of our job and and fantastic. That's what we do, bring it on. Um, but uh, the benefit of that is we always see the most modern techniques made against our customers uh, before they make their way down to kind of the rest of the world, right? And the trend has shifted from individuals kind of bringing together attack tools and making the attacks. Like the most common attack that's going to be relevant for your audience is credential stuffing, where they're using bot to test credentials to break into your uh, accounts and then figure out what's of value in the account. Maybe there's a credit card and record and they do return fraud or whatever it may be. Um, But they're they're breaking into the accounts. And um, that used to be, hey, I used to need to go and manually get a bunch of proxies. I need to go find the tools, open bullet. I needed to go set it up. I had to go find the passwords, blah, blah, blah. I had to go do all that work myself. And then you have to kind of be somewhat technical to do that. And that information used to be a little bit hard to find, maybe on the dark web. So, and dark web's not that hard to access. It's, you know, a Tor browser and you're in. That, that was maybe three, four years ago. About 18 months ago, we saw a dramatic shift from dealing with individuals attacking our customers to dealing with organized businesses that built SaaS businesses that were designed to attack our customers. So it's completely shifted. It's it's pretty mind blowing. And you can like now just go search on the internet and find tools. Uh, there's a, a common one called Zenrose. It's a, um, a UK company that got venture funding. What? Surprise, surprise. 
that is designed to bypass um, anti-scraping tools and you can either pay them to do it or they will give you tutorials on how to do it. You can go search Zen Rose and you will find it. Um, and it has copious details on how to bypass typical bot vendor software and all that kind of stuff. Or you can just pay the money and they'll do it for you. They can go scrape the inventory. They can go grab whatever you want them to grab. And they'll bet. And they're a business with engineers that every day their job is just to build ways around uh, tools like wax and things like that. Um, so that's kind of one thing, the access to really sophisticated attack capability. These aren't like script kitties. These guys are really good, they're really good at what they do. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is the information has gone from being kind of buried on the dark web to being in like Discord channels. You can just yeah. go search, like there's one called Scraping Enthusiasts where you can just go search it and you can go join their Discord channel and they will tell you everything about breaking into anything you want to break into with uh, automated tools. And it's all just publicly available. Like they, they just exist and out in the open. And it's kind of scary to think how easy and accessible the information is. There's, a, there's another community where you can learn how to um, steal like hype inventory, like limited edition items. Um, and they'll teach you how to pay taxes and they'll teach you how to do whatever you need to do to, to make the money look legitimate. Um, it's pretty scary. This is just sitting yeah. on it. So the, the cybercrime is a service concept, whilst, again, not new, just the accessibility has risen it to the forefront. And what, it, what the net net is, is it's cheaper than ever and easier than ever to make the most sophisticated attacks that are really out there. And that's really scary because that lowers the barrier to entry for crime and it makes the effort as a defender materially harder. It's much harder to defend against these cybercrime platforms than it is to defend against individuals. It also changes the equation around how do you make it too expensive for them when they've got a thousand people funding them. So like that's, it's a really different ball game. And yeah, this is kind of a concerning trend, I would say going yeah, into a, little bit. So, uh, a good thing to be aware of that it's happening because it, it's, it's just the ball game has changed in the last, 12 to 18 months. I was saying, like I said on a couple, I think it was a couple episodes back that um, that the accessibility is, I think one of the main drivers is is where this was so often thought of as something that people that spend, have computer science degrees that are sitting in their basement in Russia were doing. But now it's literally your neighbor in your suburban neighborhood that has a computer. He has a VPN. He has a Tor browser. He paid 50 bucks to buy one of these little pieces of software that he got on telegram or on discord and he's out there stealing sneakers now and yep. then he's out there then relisting and then and, and, and cleaning that money like there's it's too it's so easy that and you never have to get up from your seat like right. ever <laughs> yeah and there's i have two perspectives on this one is you know these people are incredibly entrepreneurial when you say the word entrepreneur i can't think of a better person to describe them than these criminals and unfortunately it kind of tarnishes the, the brand of entrepreneur but they're incredibly entrepreneurial. These people work harder than the regular guy at a day job. They, they, they're in it to figure out how do I make money. You know, they're they're pulling long hours. They're all talking to each other. You know, it's it's yeah. You know, for one level, there's some respect for that. But the other part of it, the problem with the accessibility and ease of getting into this, I would consider kind of these bot attacks kind of a bit of a gateway drug to crime because once you like it seems not that bad stealing some stuff from a store or buying stuff and then reselling it it's like hey i'm using my credit card it's okay i'm making a huge return but then it kind of gets darker and darker and darker and darker now i'm breaking into bank accounts because hey why not it's not that hard and and now i'm suddenly you know buying drugs and i'm you know and then it and you know i, I had a presentation once with the head of cybercrime of the un and his perspective is um, this stuff all ends in the same place and it's it's all really bad. It gets really dark very quickly for people that go down this path. They start as an 18 year old doing these more simplistic attacks. And then by the time they're 25, they're in proper crime because uh, you just kind of that's the community. That's what you get stuck in. And, you know, it ends up in child trafficking and horrible shit. Like it's just that that's where the end game is for these people. So it's it's really important uh, not just to protect our merchants, but I think it's really important in general to help the baddies against themselves, to be honest. Like stopping them doing this stuff is a good thing for them as much as it is a good thing for our customers. So That's an excellent 
angle. Like I've never thought about that because I do, I've seen, you know, you get that rush from that first one yeah. and then you, then you want more and then you everyone want more. In the and then you want more. Every one of us, we're helping stop that from occurring. So this is a really important mission for the entire industry. It's not just about protecting our customers. It's fundamental. It's helping shift people out of crime long term. So everyone should feel good about being involved in this space. We need more people in the security and fraud space. But, uh, you know, it's something yeah. that we care quite a lot about at Arcos. I think that, um, you know, as, as we talk about some of these these little things that have been happening, like you talk about like these credential stuffings, I think we've all seen some of these these attacks directly on our site and we, we've thrown things at it you know like i think first everybody's everybody's always their first exact step is to do some sort of like block list it seems like yep. and then after that you usually hit a captcha and then it's it's trying to find the balance on the captcha of like when to fire the captcha do you do to everybody and a lot of sites yeah. unfortunately do say yeah everybody captcha which pisses me off yeah. and, and then i think you know over the last 10 years we moved more into like these dynamic rules and then I think um, then there was like these these companies that came up that tried to like change the the web forms. Um, so like every time you loaded the page, it was a scram. Like it didn't say first underscore last. Yep. It was like uh, it was different. But those really slowed down sites and they were really heavy. You had to have boxes. And now when we moved to cloud infrastructure, that got to be a little more difficult. But I'm sure as as that moved from from a physical box into software, that that's easy enough for these guys to block now too. You know, so. What are some of the things that, that you guys, like if you can kind of take me some of the history of, of what you think some of those things are and yeah, then can, how Arcos is doing that, if you could. Yeah, I think, so first and foremost, a good a good place to start is, am I like, how do I measure this type of attack occurring against me? And there's a, there's a pretty easy way to measure credential stuffing, which is the success rate of logins from attempt to login being successful. The way credential stuffing works is they're just testing hundreds of thousands of attempts, right? So naturally when you're getting attacked by credential stuff and the success rate plummets off off the cliff yeah um typical login success when it's healthy should be 60 percent or better so 60 percent of attempts should successfully log in so if you're around 60 percent or higher you're good you, you should there's your baseline that. everybody there's your baseline. That's, a really good, that's a really good metric to track you should track that metric every company should track that metric um during a credential stuffing attack, that success metric goes from 60% down to one to 3%. So if your success rate is in the one to 3% ratio, you're being attacked. Absolutely, you're being attacked. Um, and that's again, like a really good metric, just as, a just as a baseline, just start there. That's a good metric as a baseline. And then in terms of mitigations, um, you know, there's a number of mitigations, of course. You know, It starts with the security team will have a WAF, Web Application Firewall, which is at the edge, and they're trying to mitigate at scale things, like they're using the same IP address over and over again. You can just block that at the WAF. That's an easy one. Um, really good attackers at this don't do that. They use proxies and they rotate through IP addresses, so they're only making a few, a few requests per attempt, um, and then they abandon. A WAF can't really help you once they start doing more sophisticated things like that. So then the next kind of layer is things like device fingerprinting. So, okay, so I've got a unique IP address every time. I've got the same fingerprint every time. So, you know, everyone on the, on the line probably uses fingerprint vendors and things like that. And that's, that's another good kind of starting defense, right? But the really good adversaries randomize their device fingerprints. So then they start coming at you with unique looking fingerprints or... Even worse, they pick the most common fingerprint and then they just randomize the attributes that are expected to be random, like the language, the time zone, things like that, which are user configurable. The user configurable um, attributes, the ones they randomize, they don't randomize the things that you shouldn't be changing, like the user agent string. They won't randomize that typically um, and they'll pick the really common ones. So the most latest version of Chrome, if you block on user agent string, you will kill a lot of your good users. So that's not really a good strategy, yeah. either, unfortunately. You'll, you'll be able to see it's, that there's a huge spike, but you can't really use it as your signature to block on, because again, everyone uses the same signature there. So, so, so many times I've joined like smaller companies when I like I come in to like do their fraud strategy and I will be talking to some of the other teams and they're like, yeah, we have a device fingerprint. I'm like, well, what, what is it? Where does it come from? What is it? They're like, well, we use browser string. I'm like, so everybody's got the same one, you know, anybody using a, a regular out of the box Apple with Chrome is just using the same string. Huh? <laughs> well, it's a thing. Like if you buy an iPhone in New York and you buy an iPhone in San Francisco and you turn them both on, they have the same fingerprint, right? That's just the reality. I mean, there's some differences, the time zone, the IP, et cetera, but like the net net is it's going to have the same fingerprint. Um, 
like there there isn't you know, there, there's a whole bunch of different fields and features but like phones really you know they clash a lot like there's not really yeah. a great way to do really unique fingerprinting on a phone like with a browser um uh, desktops are a little bit easier because you've got different screen resolutions and stuff like that but every iphone has the same screen resolution so you lose you know you lose quite a fair bit when trying to fingerprint phones so you, you got to be careful there so then yeah okay so i can't rely on i can't rely on ip i can't rely on fingerprint um so this is where it starts coming into kind of more difficult stuff like you then need to start thinking about okay what's the reputation of that ip address is it a proxy like you can't figure that out by there yourself you, you need a vendor you need a vendor for that sort of stuff mm -hmm. Um, you know, Arcos does provide an IP reputation component, but there's there's others that do it as well. It's a pretty typical kind of feature, IP reputation. Um, the device fingerprint is like, okay, I can't rely on the fingerprint being uh, the signal for the attack. You need to look at different features of fingerprint. So you, you need to look for fake fingerprint signatures. So, you know, one of the capabilities we offer is uh, device spoofing detection, where they, they, they generate fingerprints that we've never seen before on any of our customers. So those those are good things that you can take action on because the more unique something is, the more likely it's to be generated as opposed to being a real device. Um, but again, you can't really build that in-house because you don't have that network. So that's another vendor. Exactly what I was going to say, because again, uh, additionally, all the companies that ever join, everybody wants to just, well, we have all the data. We know our customer. And, right. and like, yeah, and like, we, we could just do that. We could just do that ourselves. I'm like, well, that's great. You know, and, and I think like for us specifically here at iHerb is a great example is we do have a an ATO tool that we built in house, but we set our own, our, our baseline, we set our baseline with that tool. So we know, because our customer is slightly different because of the regions that we do business in, but our baseline is different than what our baseline would be for someone that's doing business primarily in the US. But at the end of the day, our fraud tool is not as successful without all of the data from all of the people that are in our space, around our space, adjacent to our space. And we get that by using a third party tool and purchasing that information from them and using that in our own model. We, we pull information back, especially from one of our other tools to say, this has been seen 15 other times today. You know, it's buying regular stuff. Don't worry about it as much as we just saw this for the first time ever. And then we have all of the top 500 merchants in the world, like probably, yeah. probably fake. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a um, big difference between buy versus build. You, you can't build certain things. And I think just the sophistication has changed to the point where I don't think people are going to be considering building unless you're, I mean, like, again, we work with the kind of brands that don't buy and they, they still bought from Arco. So it's, um, it's yeah, it's just a really hard problem to do by yourself in-house. And, you know, the folks listening, likely, yes, our day job is security, but the companies we work for, they're not security companies. Like they're merchants, they're selling inventory. Like that's not the mission and motto and the lifeblood of what the business does. Um, so it's a bit hard. Uh, obviously, like an Arcos, that's all we do. All we do is stop these baddies from doing stuff. Like, yeah. that's it. We don't do anything else. Um, Even so the security people that they hire that are doing those jobs all day, they got other things they're doing. Their, their one job right. isn't stopping bots. You know, they have right. other things. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, and then another another really healthy signal is um, what are the attackers doing? So are they jumping straight to the login page? Are they jumping to other flows? Like you can you can kind of use that also as a pretty good um, signature too. And then another good signature is behavioral biometrics, which sounds far more fancy than it really is. It's it's really looking at motion and movement. And yes, the attackers do have tools that spoof this, even Open Bullet, the common tool, it does do spoofed mouse movements and stuff like that. But it's still yet another thing the attackers have to set up and do. The, the goal is you kind of want to do a bit of everything and, and, and force them to keep spending more money and time dealing with your defenses than someone else hasn't set up the right defenses or the, the 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 profit the profit return doesn't make a lot of sense. The good thing with um, these attacks is good and bad thing is they have to happen at scale, which means if you can incrementally add cost every attempt to the point where that breaks the math equation, then you've won. Um, and that's where again, like you mentioned, dynamic rules come into play. So you use all these kind of data signals first and foremost to kind of make an assessment. You got to do like a risk reputation. It's not just on or off. That's a really bad way to do risk because you'll blow up user experience if it's always on, and you'll have no security if it's always off. Yeah. Uh, so you can't you can't be a boolean, and so that just doesn't work. Um, especially in the merchant world where there's so many competitors that they can go buy from them. Like you don't want to have friction. It's not great. So you got to be risk graded. So the higher risk, the more friction you want to impose. So it might be something like, okay, we we think you're a bot. You know, a capture might be a good response. 
problem is a lot of these tools have good ways to bypass captures and that's a different problem. Um, another potential challenge is uh, multi-factor authentication, but you need your customer to opt into multi-factor authentication. You can do email verification. That's a, that's a pretty good one that doesn't require opt-in because you yeah. already have this email. Um, obviously vulnerable to things like email compromise, but it's a good that's... one for stopping things like cred stuffing. Each attack technique, you need to use a different defense. So it's it's really dependent on what the attack is doing as to what's the appropriate challenge. So you really need to figure out what's the context of the attack. You know, credential stuffing, the goal is really to make the cost for bots too high. If it's social engineering, you really need to make, you know, things like multi-factor and stuff. We're going to talk about um, how you get around even multi-factor. They've got new techniques to do that now too. But um, everything is about increasing cost and effort. Not There's no silver bullet, but it's all about incrementally raising that effort through these different, different um, types and approaches and, uh, you know, we basically do all of that. So we, we have a bit of everything. And our perspective on this is you need to do a bit of everything. You can't just be a one trick pony. If I'm a behavior biometrics vendor and they spoof biometrics, so it looks legit. Well, I'm no longer useful. I can't stop the problem. So you, you got to obviously be focused on fundamentally, how do I make the whole problem stop, which is why we have kind of a pretty broad spread of capabilities. Yeah, and I, I did a way back in 2019. Again, I, I did a um, a post for the MRC about multi layer, uh, and I compared it to a lasagna. Like you have to have multiple layers. Uh, okay, I, you just you just have to. And and like I think one of the things that too that's super important. And I see this is where I see a lot of veteran fraud finders get stuck too, is they get really complacent in their tool, and they're like, this is just it does everything I need. It's all, it's all I ever need, you know, and they don't ever look at emerging technologies and what these, what the trends are as much like they're aware of the trends, but they don't, and their tool might not address it. And they're, they just don't, they close their mind off and they're not open to experimenting with new tools. And that's something that like every year for me, we're always looking and evaluating at things. And we made a change to our tool last year because the tool that we had didn't have the capabilities that we, we needed. And we have to have that open mind. I think everybody, especially in this evolving world where now they're coming at us with tools just as sophisticated, like those tools that you've used for the past 10 years that you think is great and no one's ever gonna figure it out, uh, they figured it out and they know how to get around it now, you know? And, and so you have to start adding these other things on top to, to kind of prompt your customers, because you don't wanna get good customers. Like I always say, we always are focusing on, on these these bad actors, but you have a large amount of your customers are good. So you don't wanna be prompting them for to force them into MFA or force them into solving a CAPTCHA when you know it's the same guy that you've seen 15 times for the last 15 years, he's trying to buy his monthly protein, you know? You That's need right. to be dynamic. And and I think that you said it excellent when you're like, the different places need different things too, you know? Like you need something for the credential stuffing, something that log in, you need something for purchase, you need something for account create, you need something for email change, you know? You need different things and you need something way out on the perimeter too to before they even get to any of that. So, yeah. Yep, it's 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 it can be pretty overwhelming if you're starting fresh, but um, it 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 does require that. And that's just the sophistication. What you, and if you don't have it, then guess what? You're the target because you're suddenly yeah. now the cheapest. We're that's uh, what we're trying to make all our people go to. Right. <laughs> is you now? That's right. Uh, so so let's talk about um, forcing people into MFA and why that is it. Well, first of all, obviously it sucks for it to be forced into MFA for most people. Um, especially for the, the the regular person, like I MFA a lot of my things just because that's just the nature of what I do for a living. Yeah. But I think for like my mom, like she would lose her shit if like she all of a sudden had to do it on her bank. Yeah. And the first thing she would do is probably auto opt into the text message. And why is that not good anymore? Yep. <laughs> the, the MFA, by the way, is a really good thing. So I always use MFA. If you can enable MFA, do it. It's a good thing. We are in the security space. We should all be good citizens of good security. So highly recommend it. Um, we all know the friction is important. Um, but the net net is the average internet goer does not want any friction and does not want to have to be opted into a security experience to buy stuff on the internet. Like they, they do not mm -hmm. feel like they are the ones that should have to go out of their way to protect themselves. They feel like that's the merchant's job. It's up to you to protect my information. If, I'm not using the yep. security features too bad. It's up to you to protect my stuff, which is fine and fair, I think, as well. I sympathize with the, um, the the customer. The goal is how do we make security as invisible as we possibly can without requiring user opt-in into stuff? I, I think user opt-in is not great as a security mechanism mm -hmm. in general. But um, it is obviously good to have if you're security-minded and want to protect your stuff. Um, 
But yes, there is no silver bullet. MFA is not a silver bullet. Adversaries have figured out numerous ways to overcome it. Uh, we can talk about a couple of those. And not only that, they've also figured out ways to monetize against you all how to make money from the MFA flow itself. And it's just, again, it goes back to this entrepreneurialism in, in fraud. They're just so creative. Um, so there's, there's two things I like to cover. One is a concept called international revenue share fraud or SMS toll fraud. And then the next one I'll cover is men in the middle reverse proxy phishing, where they can actually bypass MFA uh, on a phishing site. You know, they used to have to call you to get your pin code, but they've got new ways of getting around it now. Um, so let's talk about the uh, SMS toll yeah. fraud first. Um, so this is, uh, and this can be on any flow where you trigger an SMS message. This isn't just logging in OTP. That's obviously an example, but it can be forgot password. It can be account creation. Maybe you send a text message to confirm that, you know, that's, that's a, a unique customer. Another technique to raise cost is sending text messages. Um, what fraudsters have figured out is they can use premium numbers where they collude with telcos and they get millions of numbers where when you call that number or when you text that number, they make money. Um, kind of like, you know, the, the, uh, the is idol. It, it's just like the old, like the 900 number things is when it, absolutely. You know. yep. Yep. Absolutely. Same, same concept. So you dial them and, and then you get charged for it. Typically used for like game shows. Like I'm going to vote for this person. It's my favorite. And they make money because, you know, you just paid them a dollar for that text message. Um, the difference here is, um, OTP cost or phone SMS cost differs by country. So in the U S it's quite cheap. It's like a fraction of a, of a penny. So this fraud doesn't happen in the U S cause they don't make enough money per SMS message, but in the UK it's, it's, uh, it's a few cents in Indonesia. It's about 30 cents to send a text message to someone in Indonesia. 30 cents. Yep. Uh, Vietnam is about 15 cents. So if you're, you're enrolling a phone number from Indonesia, it's going to cost you 30 cents. They, the, the fraud still will keep three to four cents. And what they do is they use a bot to automate your SMS text flow. And either every time you create an account with them, you're sending a text message. They use a bot to mass create accounts. And then they make three cents every time they create an account, which means it's costing you 30 cents. That's a lot as, of As the merchant. Yeah, yeah as the merchant. We're getting that's built. really expensive. Um, and then same goes for login, where they can basically change the phone number that you're sending the OTP to and continually trigger, oh, I forgot my password, I forgot my password, I forgot my password. And we work with merchants where they're losing hundreds of thousands a week to this type of abuse. And these are big merchants that you know, you're all familiar with, that huge losses. You know, We have some customers where it's millions a month, yeah. um, and it happens overnight. Like it, it's not something where it's like, the bill goes just like, you know, incrementally up. It's just like once the attackers figure out you've got a vulnerability here, they completely hammer they you. Hammer it, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and again, you can, you can identify this one pretty easily. So what you want to look for is, and, and this is the weird thing. Most fraud teams don't look at the SMS bill. That's like the finance team's job. Yeah. But now it's a fraud team problem. So I think we're going to start seeing more fraud teams getting looped into, hey, we're seeing fraud on our SMS bill. What the hell is that? Um, but the countries you want to look for are primarily in Europe. I can I can mention a couple of them. Yeah. Basically, if your baseline bill changes dramatically, but your user registration or your good traffic isn't changing in these in these countries, you know you've got a problem. Um, so a, a couple of the big ones are uh, and they're all countries, you know, you're not you're not typically probably selling to. So like I mentioned Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Russia, uh, um, yeah, there's a there's a Nigeria. We can actually put the list maybe as part of Kenya, yeah, um, um, and even the UK because again in the UK mm. it, it costs several cents to send a text message. The problem with that is um, you can't really block these. You can maybe maybe some merchants are okay blocking some of these regions, but you're not going to block the UK. You, you're still going to want people to buy. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe, maybe Jordan will block the UK, but uh, maybe. Maybe, probably not. Um, so you, again, you need to go back to like, what are the techniques to stop adversaries using automation on top of the MFA? So it's not just, you can't just use MFA to stop cred stuffing because you're going to get hammered with this fraud instead. So you need to still use anti-bot techniques in front of your MFA yep. now to stop this type of fraud from happening. It doesn't end. It's, it's just it, not- It never- it's no just what, what 
like for two years, I've been up on all those stages, just ranting like a crazy person about you're losing more money on abuse attacks than you ever are on fraud. Like you worry about your your two basis points on your fraud losses. Meanwhile, someone's ripping you for thirty million dollars on on SMS fraud. For yeah. us, people try and, and create fake accounts and they hit us with bots on on upvoting reviews. You know, I mean, we got we got privy to that. But it, even even that, I mean, nobody's immune to these things. You know, like we yeah. we were aware it was happening, but we needed to throw technology at it, and that takes yeah. a little while to yeah. throw the technology at it. You know. Yep. Yeah. yeah. They they do require technology solutions, and it's it's again, it's hard to keep this stuff in house. You you can you can play whack a mole if you've got the resources. Yep. You're going to need quite a lot of people. You're going to need engineers, which are really hard to get, as we all know. Engineering resources are probably the hardest to get because they're all being used to grow the business, right? Not not protect the business. That's just the reality. Yeah, they're, the growth, the growth, like what they have when they put up their little project sheets, the ones that have the biggest dollars attached to it are the ones that go first. Right. And like, I'm sorry, what's something that's worth 15 Even if it's a $5 million problem, the $15 million profit one's going to go first. Right. But at, at the end of the day, you know, like it's, it feels like so much, the, the knee jerk response to these things is like, just turn it off. Like just stop it. Like that's always the first thing when it, it could be something that's useful or something that's liked when you really need to just solve the problem instead of just breaking it to make it go away. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. You can't really turn off MFA so easily. That's a, that's a tricky one. You'll yeah. have different problems if you do that. So yeah, they, they're definitely, they're definitely all about boxing in. I mean, again, it's, it's good job security. We're not going anywhere. Security teams are pretty important. Security and fraud is a, is a critical component. Uh, well justifies the cost of those orgs. Um, so that's, that's toll fraud. And then the, the, the last one I wanted to talk about is this new technique called um actually microsoft released a blog yesterday they call it adversary in the middle we've been calling it man in the middle reverse proxy yeah. i guess they they came up with a new term because you know why not um so either it's adversary in the middle or man in the middle but it's a new type of reverse proxy technique so basically what the fraudster does is they set up a phishing site that looks like your site they send out a bunch of emails claiming to be you your customers click the links and they go to the fake site and they input their username and password because unfortunately that's what happens. Um, this particular technique is focused on accounts that are protected by multi-factor. So typically with multi-factor, if you have username and password, that's not enough to get into the account. So that's that's good. That's why we use multi-factor. This new technique, when they put in the username and password, what it does is in real time, it sends those credentials to you as the merchant's real authentication server. Right, So they've sent up the real username and password to your real server from their fake site. And that makes your real server say, OK, you've got the correct username and password. Now give me the multi-factor. So I'll trigger OTP back to the user's real phone. So now your customer who's at the phishing site just got a text message from you or an OTP pin or a push notification or whatever, asking you to confirm that this is you and, and uh, you know type in this code to verify that you're trying to log in. And what the phishing site does is it updates the UI to say now, please input your uh, your authentication ah. code, and then you type in your authentication code in the phishing site, and then it sends that again to your real merchant backend authentication server, which says, "Yep, you've given me the real authentication code. Here's the login cookie. Go about your business." And then the attacker just stores the login cookie, and now they can access your account anytime they and want. They've got a validated cookie. That'd work even for Google Authenticator too, wouldn't it? It works for everything. Yeah, it's 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 super scary, and there's 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 tools that you can get. There's SaaS cyber crimes as a service tools. There's one called Evil Proxy, uh, which will perfectly clone your website, perfectly clone the Google authentication flow, perfectly clone the Facebook flow. It looks like it's the legit thing, but it ain't. It also works for push notifications. It works for, um, as you say, the OTP from a Google auth. It works for SMS. It works for everything. So this is the new phishing technique, which can be infinitely scaled. There is no human involvement for the fraudster. It's just, I'm setting up a website and I'm mass collecting login cookies. All these accounts are protected by multi-factor and I'm still getting in them. Um, some companies we work with will require multi-factor, not just on login, but also on like changing account details or something like a high value item or whatever it may be. Like a FinTech might do like a high, a high, uh, on a transfer, you need to also do a multi-factor. So what the phishing site does, it's it's pretty funny actually, um, is they'll, obviously when you give them the MFA, you've given the correct one and they've logged in as you, but they'll say, oh, wait, we're having some internet difficulties. Just wait a moment and they'll do like a spinning wheel. And then they'll say, oh, we're sending you a new pin. 
type that one in, when in reality, what they've done is they've gone to the high value thing that triggers the second OTP. And now that's getting sent to the real customer. And then they're putting it in again. And you could change, you could, you could disable, or you could change the device that the MFA is on by doing that. Couldn't you? You can do everything. It's, it's very creative. So um, this is where you need to do things. Uh, and, and you might think, well, I can do like continuous authentication. Well, the IP address that logged in is the IP address that's being used because they're proxying everything. So it's, yeah, this is where things start getting quite complicated. So you, yeah. this is where you need to work with your authentication provider um, because it's really hard to uh, to protect against these kind of attacks. Uh, again, you're basically saying, hey, it's on the customer to figure it out. That's not quite true. There is technology that can solve this. Um, there are a number of techniques. We're launching a product around this phishing technique. Uh, we actually have about six or seven customers using it today, some really big merchants that are using our technology to stop this. But it's it's a really sophisticated, uh, and we've only seen it at the high end of town. But this is coming for the masses soon. Yeah. So like everyone should be very very mindful that if you've got MFA, that's great, that's a great baseline. But that ain't enough anymore. You need to start thinking about how do I now protect my MFA itself? Like MFA is just not the silver bullet. That's that crazy. What it was. I'm starting uh, to sweat over here right now. I'm not gonna lie. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I got MFA on a lot of things, and I got. Like Google Authenticator, I got to scroll on these days. So, yeah, you know. yeah, it's it's. I mean, this is just the arms race, right? That as we build technology to combat them, they build technology to combat those tools, and it will continue forever. Like this is not stopping, which is why again you need to focus on. As long as they're not making money, then you're winning long term. But like just using tech to stop a single kind of point of failure, uh, you need to have a bigger strategy, a more broader strategy than that. But uh, yeah, these are yeah. these are the joys of what we get to kind of figure out. This is the, the puzzles of being in the security space, uh, which again is a bit different to fraud. Like where it is stopping the money movement is the ultimate goal of a product like Arcos, but we don't do that. We sit top of funnel and we try and make it as expensive as possible. And if we can't stop them at login, we we give all of our data to the merchant so they have a chance to stop them before they commit the fraud. But yeah, it's 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 a team effort and it's it's hard. It's grueling work. There's a lot to do. It's weird because like like you said, like it's it's different than fraud, but at the same time, like it, it this, this, the solutions, you know, are are they're not similar technologies, but they're similar approaches where you have to have different things at different touch points on the site. Yeah. Like that's just how it is. And it's gonna go. And I'm sorry, like like folks, like if for my fraud listeners that, that number listen, you know, we've been talking about how you interface with your security team. Like it's time to get cozy. It's time to maybe even sit in the same room uh, yeah, yeah, and really yeah. start talking about it. Yeah, we, yeah. we find most most don't. So most fraud teams don't really talk that closely. And it's it's a true shame because the security folks have top top of funnel data, really good data upstream, mm -hmm. and they typically don't really share it with each other. You can you can fine tune the security systems because you say, hey, these are the ones that got in. Could you like next time try and find things similar yeah. for doing it again? So that's great. And then the reverse is true. Any data they had, make sure that's passed down to like your, your payment tool or whatever you're using. So in there, you can write rules based on that kind of data as well. So it's it's a really important partnership um, between security, maybe identity as a team in there as well. And then the yeah. fraud the fraud team, like all, all three of those super important pillars to protecting a company. I think like for so many years, the, the fraud team has just been like security team light, you know? And then like you have the the real technical folks that come in, but I, with at, at iHerb here, we've been really good since I started at, like I have a, like I always, I say all the time, I have a, a, every other Thursday I meet with that team, but we have a channel that we, on our, on our G chat that we are constantly sharing. Here's some IPs, here's some accounts, you know, but bo both ways, like they say, Hey, we just got like 10,000 hits on this, on the logs from this. Can you guys see anything? And then we go take a look. And the same thing is like, we just saw these 15 accounts that like eight people called customer service and they, they reached out to us. Can you take a look and see if there's something going on? And it's it's a constant back and forth all day, every day. And I think like the, the the dialogue, like the communication that you need to have in your company, like you just, you're not sitting on fraud Island anymore, folks. Like you are, you're a larger player in your organization. So it's time to, to act like it. Yeah. And all these things, and this, again, we don't want to sound too overwhelming. Like this is, sadly kind of the state of things so this is all coming but um it's it's good to be aware of it and it's good to start thinking about what do we do about it either we yeah. we strategize internally build things internally we find partners that can help us keep abreast and keep ahead of things um obviously at arcos you know this is what we do every day like this is just what we do this is what we live uh this is what we live for and we love it you know it's 
it's kind of weird because people hate getting attacked, but we're like, bring it on. We love it. Like every time yeah. we're attacked, we're like, okay, bring on the challenge. <laughs> what are they doing? Like we reverse engineer attacks every day as we speak. We're being attacked on some customer. That's just, and I can see on Slack people are talking about new techniques, and it's just, it's just the life. And that's again, you know, you talk about you know fighting fraud. Like this is the end game is stop them from making money. So it all ends there. Uh, whether we stop it with bots or whatever, but end of the day is that stop them from making money. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Like everybody, I encourage you, like I'm going to put all the Arcos information in in the description, like I always do. And in the post that I put up about this, but I encourage you to like really maybe if you have any, like if anything has sparked any interest, like if it's happening, maybe talk to your security team about some of the things that we talked about here today. And I really encourage you guys to reach out and, and like see a demo of the Arcos tool. It's really cool. I really think that like just, just spending the time and looking at it and sharing it with your security teams, it might prompt like some sort of something in your mind and, and you might discover something. So I really, really, really encourage it. So, so Kevin, like, please send me all the information that who you want me to have them all call, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, we're more than happy. Um, again, uh, appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about this stuff. We, we love it. It's, uh, it, it scares people sometimes when we, we share what's coming, but it, again, it's important to be aware of, of what's coming down the line so you can figure out how to best prepare for it. Yeah, you, you need to be aware so you can spot it and you know what to do and you know who to call. So again, thank you for, for lending me your time. I know you're a busy man. You got a company to run over here and you you got all these attacks that you're finding, but thank you for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, any, any final thoughts? No, I think that's it. And again, just remember how important what we're doing is in this space. It's not just the day job of stopping fraud. It's, it is, it's ultimately changing people's lives. It, it may not sound like that. You may not pause to think, but it, it has a very positive impact on the world if we can divert people away from doing crime. So I think that's always worth keeping in the back of your mind as you work in this space. I love that. I love that. Well, I will be seeing you um, next month at RSA, so uh, we'll have to get a drink. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs>